It's good to see you this morning. I am glad that we are able to be together. Um, I, I think maybe it's just fair to put on the table at the beginning that one of my one of my soapboxes is that I think it's so important that we spend time intentionally talking about how God calls us. One of my personal agendas is really rooted in in knowing and believing that God has a call for each of us. The, the challenge then is to listen to God calling us and then to respond to God's call. But, um, but you're here. And so that's the beginning step. And some of you have been here, as it were, before. And so it's good that we can be together again. And it's good that we can continue to have our conversation. Now, one of the things that I want to make sure that, that we also have on the table is the reality that God calls all of us. Every single one of us, God calls. Sometimes we get into our heads that God only calls people to professional ministry, but that's not the case. I have a friend who, before becoming a pastor, is was a nurse midwife, and she said that she felt called by God to be a nurse midwife, and then later in her life, she felt called by God to be a pastor. And so whatever it is, however it is, God calls us. And so I want us to be clear about that. But the other thing I want to be really honest about, part of, part of the reason that I really like to work with this particular weekend, this particular event, is because I think it's also really important that we listen for how God might be calling us into ministry, and so a lot of the conversations that we have at a God's call event is around particular types of ministries into which we can be called. And so we'll spend a lot of time throughout today talking about what those options could be, how we discern that, how we get there, what that could look like. And so when you leave today, my, my hope is really for a couple of things. One, that, that you leave on the same page as, as me that we're all called, but also listening to hear if God is calling you to a particular type of ministry. Now, ministry can also be outside of the church, can also be outside of being a pastor. Ministry can be in the hospitals, in the schools, um, working in a factory. That, that can be ministry as well. So I want to make sure that, that when we're using words like called into ministry, that, that we understand that that could really manifest itself in any place and in any way. Is that clear? Okay. Um, but, but part of, part of my agenda is also that we talk about being called into ministry as a pastor, as a deacon as a campus minister, all kinds of different opportunities that we have. Now, let me share with you a little bit about my own, my own call, my own call journey. When I was in high school, I was on the speech team, which meant that um, for competition, I would read out loud. And (laughs) I I competed doing that. I competed reading out loud. And I I would read from Alice in Wonderland. That's what I took on tour for, um, for competitions, for meets. And I had different voices for each of the characters. And one day, my speech um, coach came to me and said, you know what, Kathy? She said, I know people in California who do speech over work, voice over work. And she said, I would love to connect you. And you could have a whole profession just doing voices. And I said, that's great, but I'm going to work for the church. (laughs) Those words had never fallen out of my mouth before. And her response was, now, come on, there's no money in that. <laughs> and, and when these words came out of my mouth that I felt called to the church, I didn't know what that would look like, and I didn't know what that meant. I was very active as a teenager in my youth group, loved youth ministry, and I thought, maybe I'm called into this. Maybe I'm called into youth ministry. And so I went to college, and I worked on having a college degree in youth ministry. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe that's what I'll do. And I met with the gatekeepers who are part of the process. I met with the district committee on ministry who are you know, part of the ministry process. And every year I'd see them, I'd say, I don't know what I'm called to. Maybe youth ministry. And they'd say, okay, thanks. Keep thinking about it. <laughs> And then one day I showed up and I said, you know what? I think I really know how God is calling me. Um, I, I had been to an exploration event 
which is an event that's hosted by the general church. And, um, and it's for persons much like yourself who are discerning call. And perhaps some of you have participated in exploration at some point. Yes, no. So yeah, great. Some of you have. Um, so I was, I was at an exploration event and I was sitting in a workshop on the ordained elder. And as I was sitting there, I thought, this is what God is calling me to. God is calling me to be an ordained elder, to be a pastor. So I discerned my call to ministry while I was preparing for a speech meet. And my speech coach said, I could get you a job in California. I said, I'm called to the church. And I discerned my call to be a pastor while sitting in a workshop. It was just this sense of peace. It was this sense of conversation that when the person who was up front was speaking, I thought, yeah, that's me. It wasn't a letter of confirmation. It wasn't a certificate in the mail from God that said, my dearest Kathleen, this is how I have called you. I didn't get a billboard. I didn't get a special Bible that was stamped in the front from God. Here is my, my plan and call for your life. It was words that fell out of my mouth from nowhere. And it was a sense of things just kind of feeling right by sitting in a workshop. How nebulous is that? So our call doesn't always come in some kind of concrete, let me prove to myself and prove to the world that this is what God wants me to do. Sometimes God's call is so quiet and so subtle, but our job, our responsibility, much like we were singing about in our opening worship songs, is that we have to open ourselves to God and listen to however it is that God is speaking to us, nudging us, calling us, directing us. And so that's, that's what our time is about. Now, I do sometimes question and wonder if maybe I haven't missed out on doing something really fun by doing voiceover work. And I think that the Simpsons are full of theology and I, I watch the Simpsons and I think, you know, that, that could be my voice. I, it could have been the best of both worlds, some theology and some, some voiceover work. And I wonder, have I missed out on something? Sometimes I think it would be really fun to have a hot dog cart and to sell hot dogs in a street corner, but only when the weather was nice. <laughs> if there's rain or snow or wind or cold, I'm not interested. But I, I think, you know, wouldn't that be kind of a fun adventure? There have been times when I've been discouraged with the church. And, and there's, um, I was behind a Wegmans truck one day when I was really discouraged. And on the back of the Wegmans truck... <laughs> They don't all say this, but, but this one did. It said, are you looking for a job? <laughs> and then it goes on and it says, how about a career? <laughs> and I could see my career at Wegmans. I could see my career. My job would be stacking the cans of creamed corn. And the biggest issue, the biggest obstacle would be that I'm not a tall girl. And I'd have to, I'd have to stock the lower shelves and not the tall ones. I mean, my goodness, yes, I'm looking for a career. <laughs> You know, so I, I sometimes wonder, but then it comes back to this, but that's not how I'm called. I'm called to the church. I'm called to serve God as a pastor, my kingdom to serve God stacking cans of creamed corn, but I'm called as a pastor. And there are some days that are really difficult. I had only been in my first appointment for a couple of years when I got a call to go to the hospital to be with a young girl. She was a teenager, and she was delivering her second child, and the baby wasn't going to live, and they knew it. And she wanted to have her baby baptized. And so I went to be with her, and when she delivered this baby that fit in my hand, I held, I held this baby and I had drops of water on my finger. And I baptized this baby in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And this mother had named her baby Nevea Hope. Nevea is heaven spelled backwards. This 15-year-old mom named her baby Nevea Hope, heaven's hope, 
because she was so desperate to know that there was a God at work in the midst of her painful situation. She was so desperate to know that she was not being punished or that she wouldn't be punished because her baby died. She was so desperate to know that her baby would be in heaven. That was one of those heart-wrenching experiences. And then I was called to the funeral for the same baby. And it was traumatizing to see this tiny white casket on one of those ugly, gray, rainy days. And when I left that day, I left crying like the cartoon characters do where the tears were shooting out the side of my head. I was a fountain of tears. Some days aren't great. A year and a half ago, I was in my office one night, and I got a call that our mission team that was in Uganda, Africa, was just in a terrorist bomb. The world fell apart in that moment. All six of our team members came home alive. And the 17-year-old girl, the youngest who was a part of that group, just the other week walked a year and a half later. That was an awful journey. That was an ugly journey. There are some things that are just not great in ministry. And sometimes you see the ugly underbelly of the church. But that's not every day. There are some days that are so wonderful. There are some days that are so wonderful that they outweigh and compensate for all of the bad stuff. A couple of weeks ago, I ran into my office on a Sunday afternoon to get some work done. And I heard these little voices of little kids playing in the church. Their parents were having Bible study after worship. And all of a sudden, these little kids were all in my office because they wanted to play with their pastor. What a great day to know that these children who are being raised in the church knew that the church was a safe place, knew that their pastor was a safe person, and knew that they could come hang out with her. What a great day. When wonderful things happen, in person's lives, when a baby is born healthy, when a person comes to faith, when a teenager goes through the confirmation process and stands before their congregation saying that they accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior and join the church, I get to be a part of that. So I get to be a part of the most wonderful experiences in person's lives as well as journeying through the ugly stuff. But that's part of what call looks like. Not every day is sunshine and bunnies. Not every day is glamorous. Not every day makes us feel good. But the reason that I continue to do this and the reason that my colleagues around this room continue to do this and not stack the cans of creamed corn at Wegmans is because this is how God has called us. And God calls each of us. And we're listening then for that call. Now, I take my call so seriously. And I take my role and responsibility as pastor very seriously. Every time I stand in the pulpit, I think about how powerful that is, how much responsibility there is in bringing a message from God. Every time when I meet with a couple to talk about baptizing their baby, Every time I meet with a couple who's getting married, every time I teach a Sunday school class or a Bible study, every time somebody calls me and says, why did this happen? Every time I hold hands with somebody who's dying. I take that so seriously. It's a huge responsibility to journey through the lives of other people. But that's an amazing call that we have and God calls each of us and God calls each of us to something. Now in order to better know how it is that God calls us or what God's call might look like, we need to spend time listening for God. We need to know what God sounds like. We need to open ourselves to hearing God speak. We need to talk about things like spiritual disciplines and practices. And I think that a lot of this will be covered throughout the day. The other thing is that we need to spend some time to to set ourselves apart and to say, 
God, what do you want from me? And that's part of being here. Now, I need to tell you that when I travel, one of the first things I look for is where I can plug in my curling iron. And so camp is not necessarily my top destination for travel. I think that church camp is a wonderful thing. I think that church camp is a good thing. And I think that after I've been at camp for about 30 minutes, I've had enough. (laughs) But the one thing I do want to share with you, there are camps for your ages. And one of the places where so many people hear and discern call to ministry is at church camp. And so I want to make sure that when you're thinking about how it is that God is working in your life, that that you don't miss any of the opportunities that might be available for you to hear God call, to hear God speak directly to you. And for some, not for me, for some, that's definitely at church camp. So please keep that in mind. Now, I think it would be helpful if we could spend a couple of minutes looking at some biblical call narratives. And to get us in the spirit of that, I want for us to together look at Moses' call in Exodus, and then I'm going to have us break into groups and look at some other call narratives. Now, in order to look at Moses' call, here's what we need. You don't need your Bibles. I'm going to help you with the narrative. But I need volunteers, volunteers who will think this is fun. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. We've got these three. Come on up. Come on up. Now, these three volunteered. Some of the others of you did raise your hands as well, and I appreciate that. And what I'm going to say is all of you now get to participate too. So in the narrative, there will be some sheep. When the sheep, when the sheep have instructions, you are the sheep. So if the sheep are to lean to the left, what are you going to do? If the sheep, your left, you can, you can lean to your left. So if it says lean to the left, what are you going to do? Okay, let's try again. You are all the sheep. (laughs) And if it says to lean to the left, what are you going to do? Oh, excellent. Good job. (laughs) And if it says lean to the right... Good job, good job. You're ready. Okay. Now, here's what we need. You, Elijah, are going to be the staff. Okay? (laughs) You, Aaron, are going to be Moses. Okay. You, Evan, are going to be the bush. So, (laughs) I'm going to have you just camp yourself right there, okay? Now, here's here's what we're going to do. I'm going to read through the narrative. You're going to do what this says. And if it says Moses says, then Moses says. Okay? Okay? If it says Moses does this. Okay? Okay. Now, Elijah, just for the sake of, you know, equal opportunity, right? (laughs) The role of the staff is traditionally written for a girl. So not only, Elijah, are you playing the staff, but you're also... (laughs) You're also playing the role of a girl. Okay? Are you comfortable with that? Very. Okay, perfect. Are you too comfortable with that? (laughs) Okay. Okay, just a good amount. Just the right amount? Okay, perfect. Okay, so now Moses comes entering and twirling his staff. (laughs) Okay, good. And then, okay, so one day a shepherd named Moses was out tending his sheep. Tending his sheep. (laughs) First, he would move his staff to the left, and all the sheep would lean that way. (laughs) Then he would move his staff to the right, and all the sheep would lean that way. Then he would do his favorite trick. He would put his staff directly in front of him, and the sheep would split down the middle. Half would lean to the left, and half would lean to the right. (laughs) (laughs) When we're finished, the power is over, right? Okay. (laughs) God observed Moses and decided to speak to him from a bush. The, Moses, the, bush, the bush said to him, Moses, Moses. Moses, Moses. 
<laughs> Moses turned to the sheep and said, I hear a voice. I hear a voice. The sheep in unison all said, bah. <laughs> and Moses said, no, really. No, really. <laughs> the bush said, come here, Moses. Come here, Moses. And take off your shoes. And take off your shoes. The sheep groaned. <laughs> the staff plugged its nose. <laughs> Moses took off his shoes and walked over to the bush. The bush said, I've seen the people's misery. I've seen the people's misery. And the way you part those sheep. And the way you part those sheep. <laughs> Moses hid his face in embarrassment. The bush said, I've got plans for you, Moses. I've got plans for you, Moses. Moses said, Who am I that I should that you should be talking to me? Who am I that you should be talking to me? <laughs> then he realized who he was talking to and said, who are you that I should be talking to you? Who are you that I should be talking to you? The bush said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses, looking at the squatty bush, said, you're kidding. You're kidding. Okay. <laughs> Suddenly, the bush caught fire. And waving its big flaming arms, <laughs> yelled in a booming voice, Throw your staff down, Moses. Throw your staff down, Moses. Moses took his staff and threw it on the ground gently. <laughs> and the staff began slithering around like a snake, hissing at Moses. Hissing at Moses. <laughs> Moses cowered in a corner and stuttered to the bush. Okay, not kidding. Okay, not, not kidding. As the staff slithered around Moses, the bush said, Moses, pick up your staff. Moses, pick up your staff. Moses gave the bush a puzzled look and then turned to a staff and said, Hey, baby, uh, you want to go out sometime? <laughs> baby? <laughs> <laughs> the bush said loudly, not that kind of pickup. Not that kind of pickup. I mean, pick it up. I mean, pick it up. Scared half to death, Moses slowly reached out toward his staff, which was still hissing. <laughs> and when he touched it, the staff immediately stopped hissing and stood tall and straight. The bush said, now go. Now go. I'm sending you and your staff to Pharaoh to free my people. I'm sending you and your staff to Pharaoh to free my people. Moses stuttered, but who am I that I should go? <laughs> who am I that I should go? The bush said, who am I that I should speak? Who am I that I should speak? Moses said, good point. <laughs> he took his staff by the hand, waved goodbye to a sheep, and headed off to Egypt. <laughs> Good job, guys. Thank you. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. So, so in that, that passage, who was being called? Moses. To do what? Free How was Moses called? By a bush. A bush. And... <laughs> And how did Moses respond? He didn't want to. He didn't want to, but then what happened? He was convinced. Then he was convinced. Then he went. What we're going to do, I'd like you to get into groups of probably six-ish. And in each of your groups, you'll need to have a Bible. I saw that many of you do have Bibles, so I don't think that's going to be a concern. So I want you to get into groups of six-ish. We need five groups. So can you form yourselves real quick? Okay, let me, let me give you some instructions real quick. The first group is right here. What you're going to do in this first group is look up 1 Samuel 3, 1 to 14. Read through the passage. Look at who's being called, to what are they being called, how are they called, and what's the response. Got it? And so each group is going to answer those questions. So group one is 1 Samuel 3, 1 to 14. Your group two, you have Esther 4. 
9 to 17. Your group three, you have Jeremiah 1, 4 to 10. Your group four, you have Luke 1, 26 to 38. And then are you group five? Okay, kind of group five, you are Luke 5, 1 to 11. You have 42 seconds to do this assignment. So who was called to what? How and the response. Okay, what we'd like to do is, is share with one another what we've learned from looking briefly at these passages. So we're going to start with group one, which had the call um, that's found in 1 Samuel 3. So we want to hear who was called to what, how, and the response. So you guys want to share? Nice and loud so they can hear you across the hall. Samuel was called... He was called because of uh, Eli's sons were blasphemy and <coughs> Okay. Um, he was called over and over, like literally by God. <laughs> and eventually he, uh, he responded by listening to what God had told him. Great. Good. Thank you. Okay. Esther. <laughs> We got as far as Mordecai was the one called. But also, like, Esther also seemed to be called. So, so I have a confusion about, like, who exactly was, like, the call. The call. Okay. I would argue, I mean, and, and we can make the case that we're all called, right? So you could say that Esther was called, Mordecai was called. But in this passage, I would, I would argue and emphasize for Esther's call. And she was being called to do what? To save the Jews. So she was being called to save her people. And how was she being called? This is where I think Mordecai steps in. Mordecai's her... Yeah, so Mordecai's her relative, and he's the one who really nudges her to, to do what she needs to do. And do you remember what her response was? Right, she called for a fast, and she asked that, that the people fast with her before she can actually respond. Okay, good, thank you. Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah was called, but he had some doubts because he thought he was too young. Okay. And then God kind of told him that he is worthy of it. Okay. And so what was he being called? A prophet for the nations. A prophet for the nations. And and his litany isn't always sunshine and bunnies, is it? It's to pluck up and tear down and... Yeah, not always good stuff. Good. Thank you. Okay. Who had Luke 1? Okay. It was Mary being called. Okay, and what's she being called to? To have a baby. Okay, and... <laughs> so she's called to have a baby, but a special baby. <laughs> okay, and how is she... How is it that she's called? By an angel. By an angel, and what's her response? Uh, she's not too excited, <laughs> but then she's okay with it. Yeah, she, she has questions, but then she says, Here am I, a servant of the Lord. Yeah. Right, good. Okay, and Luke 5. Um, Simon Peter was being called, and James and John and the other people that were fishing. And... To what are they being called? They're being called to pretty much go make disciples. Yeah, they're being called to make disciples. And how are they called? I don't know, Jesus just kind of came up to them and was like, they were fishing, and then he was just... He just said, we're going to go fish for men instead of fish. So Jesus showed up when they were doing their regular, their regular stuff. And what was their response? Um, they were astonished, and then they went and followed him. Then they went and followed him. Good. So in what we hear from just these five narratives of Scripture is that five different people were called to very different things in very different ways and had very different responses. So for us, our stories will be just as, as various. I mean, there will be as much variety for us and what God is calling us to, how God is calling us, what that looks like, and how we respond.
Now, in, in just a moment, we're going to watch a video that I, I want for us just to really watch, listen to, and, and listen to how maybe God might be speaking to us as we see the images, as we listen to the words.
ancient story says you gave up your life, your flesh, and your blood for love. And as the story goes, you're still reaching. You watch over the grieving. You capture every sigh. You measure the space between every heartbeat. And there's a promise that winds its way through every weather page. A feast for the hungry, the delivery of the captives, healing for the desolate.
their mind.